This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Hello, this is Eric Rostad coming to you right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Today I'm going to do a special episode and I'm going to cover the state of the Books of Titans project. So where is it? Where is it going? And what's it going to look like in the new year and the new decade? Uh, I'm also going to cover some key insights, some some key takeaways, ideas that have spanned a number of books. So I'm going to pull one from 2019, and then I'm going to cover four that have been over the entire project. So all three years of this project, what are some key insights uh, that have spanned a number of the books? And then finally, I'm going to answer some questions that I've received about the project on social media. So on to segment one, the state of the project. I started this in 2017, Books of Titans. I started it as a way to read more good books and it helped me make changes to to help me remember what it is I I was reading. So this is my third full year of, of setting a goal of reading 52 books. Started it in 2017. It, that first year, I made it through 51, so there's one book I didn't get to. In 2018, there were four books I didn't get to, so I read 48 of the 52. But this year, 2019, is the first year that I made it through all 52 books. And I, I, di- I actually did it early. I, I finished by December 10th. And I, what I do is I, I add all the pages together of those 52 books. So I don't, I don't look at it as like, I need to be reading one book a week, because some of the books are a thousand pages and some are 70 pages. So what I do instead is look at it on a per page basis. And so there were 17,000 something pages total for the 52 books this year. I divided that by 365 and I knew I needed to be at 48 pages per day to make it through all my books this year. I was actually at 50 pages per day. And so that's, that's why I finished a little bit early. Uh, but but looking at it in that sense of, of how many pages do I need to read per day, that, that helps to, to me to know where I need to be on a daily basis with, with my reading. And as you'll find out in this episode, a big part of this project is just a simple daily habit, setting a daily habit of reading. So each year I, I have achieved the goals in the sense of reading good books and remembering what I read more so than I did in the past. And even, even the years that I didn't get through all 52 books, that was still a heck of a lot more books than I'd ever read without this project. So just the, the, the focus of having a goal of having a set number of books that I want to read has helped push me to read more books. And then I've, I've done so many different things to help me remember what I read. That is, uh, underlining in the book, taking notes in the book, actually writing all over the book, uh, sharing my thoughts on the website after I read each book, recording podcast episodes about a lot of the books, and then also trying to pull just one thing, one key idea from each book that all those things have helped me to remember more books. So those are kind of the, the main benefits of of the project so far uh but i also wanted to share some unanticipated benefits because these have been these have been cool and and not really something i i set out to to have happen but uh have just been a neat byproduct of of setting a reading project each year the first one is just the people i've met Uh, i've met people in person uh, some local here to nashville but then from other parts of the the states as well and uh, so in terms of, of physically meeting people, it, it's mostly uh, people locally here. But then just me- obviously meeting people people over the internet uh, online, and that that's all over the world. So I've corresponded with a lot of people uh, all the way from Australia to uh, you name it. It, it. It's it's been really neat to to just meet different people who uh, who share a love of of reading. Um, another benefit is that it has helped clarify my thinking and. The reason I state this one is because I, I thought going into this project that it would do the opposite. I thought that by reading a lot more books than I'd ever read in the past, it would cloud my mind. Um, it would just be too much information, information overload, and then it would just be impossible to, to really sift through that. But it's had the opposite effect, and that's been really neat. And I, I think the main reason for that is that I'm seeing certain ideas span a variety of types of books. So I may see a, a, a specific idea or insight in a novel, and then I'll see it in a business book. 
and then in a biography, and then I'll find it again in a memoir. And, and once you start seeing these common ideas, which I'll, I'll be covering in the next segment, some of the key insights from this project, once, once you start seeing those in a number of books, it actually helps clarify like, okay, this is an important idea. This should be maybe a foundational idea. And so it, it actually just kind of helps clarify and, and combine ideas in a way that I did not anticipate. It's also helped with my running. And I'm a big proponent of having some sort of a physical activity exercise in your life. Uh, but I've found that it's helped with my reading. And then also that my reading has helped with my running. So on the obvious level, I mean, I've read books about running as part of this project. And those have, have led to insight. But sometimes it's, it's books that aren't necessarily about running. But they might be more about mindset or or nutrition or something like that. And so in the past, with I've, I've always run, but um, I've really started to love it more and, and get better at it recently. And I think that's mainly because with the books I've been reading, it's focused on more of the mental side of things where I was always focused on physical. Like I, I just need to get better physically with running. But as I've improved mentally and with nutrition, that has helped my running. So I, I do encourage you if... if, uh, if you, you don't do an exercise or don't have a sport that you participate in. That may, it may seem counterintuitive, but uh, if you're trying to read more, also get some sort of exercise going in your life. You, you may think that, well, that's going to take away my time of reading, but it, I think it enhances it and, and it gives you time to process the, the things you're reading as well. Uh, another benefit is it's changed my lifestyle. I, I, I view reading now as just part of my life. I, it, it's not like, a, oh, now is this extra thing I have to do at the end of the day. It's like, it's just, it's integrated with my life. It's, it's part of my lifestyle. Um, and that also entails getting rid of things. And just out of necessity, I, I had to get rid of things to be able to read 52 books per year. Uh, so some of those things are obvious, like uh, TV. Um, I'll watch the occasional movie, but like, like, we just don't have the TV on in the house with news all the time or that sort of thing. Uh, and then that's another thing I gave up is news. I used to read the New York Times almost daily, that or the Wall Street Journal. And I, I just don't see the benefit anymore. And I'm not smart enough to be able to sift through n the news to find out what's what's legit, what's not. And even if the this, this story is 100% true, uh, like one thing I found out in, in Factfulness, uh, the book this year, is that even if the news is 100% true, it could be distorting how how I view things because it may be just focusing on the wrong things. So it, the news may be focusing on terrorism or a murder, but that's a very small thing compared to the whole. And so you're not given that perspective or context when you're when you're watching the news. So just things like that and just wasting time like the things I used to waste time on, I, I, I don't have time to waste time on those things anymore. Um, also, this idea of, of passing time versus enriching time. And this project has helped to enrich time. And I, I compare that, uh, maybe a, a obvious contrast here, but passing time of, of, of just watching movies or watching binge-watching shows. Uh, I, I was talking to a friend of, a few weeks ago about, about reading, and he finished this one book, and he just said, the sense of accomplishment of reading that book was so much greater in something that he never experiences watching Netflix. Even if it's a fascinating show, he's learning, it's a great show, binge-watching, there, there's you finish that, and there's not this, like, sense that you've accomplished something but there is with reading and especially with like a reading project where where you set out a goal and, and you achieve that goal like there's just this awesome sense of accomplishment in that so that's just another un unanticipated benefit of of the project now there are some things i need to work on as well and, and the main one is just a balance of of this project with with time with my wife uh there there were nights where i should have been hanging out with her and I was I was just stuck in the book and, and reading the book, and we're we're at a weird place in life right, right now. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you can can relate, where we have young kids. So even getting the kids to bed, and one of us is usually uh, doing that, and the other is 
uh, doing something else. And, and so if my wife was, was getting the kids to bed, I would just be reading. And then once that was finished, I would keep reading and I need to not do that. I need, I need to have a better balance with time with my wife. I, I do not want this project to become overarching to where it, it takes over the, the more important things in life. And so that, that is one area I, I do know that I need to to work on in the new year. Another area is just, uh, so last week I did an, an episode where I covered all 52 books from the 2019 reading list. I, I stacked each one on my desk. And if you haven't listened to that episode, it, it was, it was kind of fun and, and some good key insights from, from a lot of these books. But there were, there were a handful of books where I just could not remember a thing about the book. And as I mentioned, one of the, one of my goals for this project is to, is to help me remember things. So things I need to work on in the new year. Uh, what I found out and realized in that episode is that if a book is, is hard for me, uh, or if, if I just don't like the book, I, I shut my mind off and, and I have a hard time remembering what's in the book. So I, I, I need to be aware of that when I'm reading those types of books. And to put in the extra effort. And so one of the books I couldn't remember last week was 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Uh, I recorded a podcast episode on it. So maybe I just need to go back and, and, and listen to that, that episode to remember the lessons or, or open the back of the book and, and look at the notes that I wrote. Um, and so that, that was another thing that, that I realized I, I, I need to work on in the, the new year and I guess recognizing when I may have a harder time remembering the book. So now into more of the, the state of the project going forward. So in 2020, I'm going to be rebranding it a little bit. And I'm not going to change the name, but I'm going to change the, the meaning of the name Books of Titans. And so first off, here's how I, I picked that name. Uh, I started the project in 2017, but it was a result of reading a, one particular book in late 2016, and that was Tools of Titans by, by Tim Ferriss. And if you're familiar with that book or the Tim Ferriss Show podcast, he interviews a number of people and, and what he does, and they're top performers and top of their field, that sort of thing. And what he does is he asks them each a question, uh, what is your favorite book? And then what is the book that you have gifted the most? So a lot of people, if, if they've read a lot of books, they have a hard time with that favorite question because they're, they're trying to rack their brain. Oh, I've got so many favorites. I can't narrow it down to a few. But that other question of what is their most gifted book, that's just kind of rubber meets the road. Here are the books that I've, I've bought for, for other people. So you get a lot of really good book suggestions and ideas from Tim's podcast and, and in this book, Tools of Titans, which was basically he was taking the the information that he was getting in these podcast episodes and then putting it into into a book. So when I read that book, I, I underlined every every book that was suggested by people. I put it into a spreadsheet because I'm a nerd and I love spreadsheets. And then there were 120 plus books from that from Tools of Titans that, that had been suggested. So in 2017, I decided, okay, I'm going to read 52 of these. So because it was tied to Tools of Titans and I was getting all my book suggestions from that books from that book, I uh, was going to call it the Books from Tools of Titans or the Books of Tools of Titans. And uh, Jason, my, my podcast co-host uh, uh, for a lot of the episodes, he said, well, just call it Books of Titans. So that's that. Uh, that's a little better. So I'll do that. So that that's where I got the name Books of Titans. That that tie in with Tools of Titans. But now, very few of the recommendations for the books that I'm reading come from Tim's podcast. There there may be a handful each year, uh, but the the project has has gone, I guess, in a different direction. Of I'm not getting all my suggestions from tools of the Titans or even the Tim Ferriss show podcast anymore. Uh, very few. So I, I want to move away from that connection. Uh, but, but I want to keep the same name. So where I'm going to be going now with, with the name books of Titans is this Titans in, in mythology and literature, the Titans were born from Uranus, which was sky and Gaia, the earth. And they were the first mythological creatures to be created when the world was formed. But I love that concept that they were born from the sky and from the earth. So they were born from the heaven 
and the earth. They, the Titans, they spanned that chasm between heaven and earth. And that's what I'm trying to do with, with this project. Uh, it's, I've, I've stated this in other episodes, but um, I, I put a stamp in each of the books that I read. And that stamp was given as a gift to me by, by a good friend of mine. And each stamp has my name on it. And it says, choir, choir virum, uh, which is Latin for seeking truth. And I had never talked about, uh, about, about that with, with my friend, but he just got that stamp and it said, seeking truth. And I put that in every single book. And that is that encapsulates what I'm going for here. And it's that, this idea of the Titans of, of uh, spanning that chasm between heaven and earth. I'm, I'm seeking out the best books. I'm seeking out the books that, that reach a different level, that, that connect to higher things, to, to heaven, uh, books that bridge that gap. And so that books of Titans, that's what that is going to mean going forward. Uh, that, that, the, this is my quest. Now, uh, a few comments about the, the podcast itself. Uh, so if, if you started listening to the early episodes of the podcast in 2017, uh, all of those episodes were Jason, my, pot, uh, my co-host, and, and myself. The more recent episodes, uh, almost all the episodes for 2019 have, have been just me. And so going forward, that'll probably be the same. Uh, a lot of that just has to do with, with place of life that, that Jason and I are in right now. We both have kids. Uh, he's in, he's in North Carolina. I'm in Tennessee. And so there is an hour time difference. And then, so you're, you're looking at getting the kids in bed, um, and then trying to, to record a podcast late at night. Uh, this is, this project is, is something, uh, outside of, of both of our main areas of, of work. So it's, it's a passion project and, and something that, that we make time for. And so it's just, it's really hard to, to make that time each week to, uh, to get together and record a, a episode over, over Skype. So, um, what, what I've been doing mainly is, is recording episodes myself. And then, and then, uh, Jason did join on, on a few this year. So, that's that's one thing. Is going forward, it, it still will be mostly me and uh, Jason will join on some episodes, and he he might start doing solo episodes himself for for some of the books that um, that he's reading. The other big change with the podcast going forward is that I'm going to be doing it every other week. So I, this year I did it every week, uh, and this was a suggestion by my wife is just to to do it every other week, just get a little more time uh, in in margin in the week, and and also just. In terms of reading, uh, almost one day per week is is solely dedicated to podcast preparation and recording. So th- that'll open up a little more uh, reading time for me as well. The, the every other week thing could change, uh, especially if Jason starts starts podcasting more, or if I just want to cover more more books or ideas that I'm reading. Uh, but but for the at least the first part of the year, it will be every other week. Uh, monetization. I have tried different things with uh, monetizing the the project and none of them have have worked and so going forward I'm not going to try that anymore I'm just I'm just gonna have this be a passion project and I think that'll actually free me up a lot too uh, I've thought about doing ads for the podcast different things like that and I'm just not gonna do that I'm not I I don't like ads in the podcast I listen to and so I'm, I'm gonna keep them out and the most important thing for me with this project in, in terms of, of it being a connection point as others is trust. And I, I see a lot of people on Instagram who are doing other reading projects and um, they're being paid to to review books and, and do things like that. And, and I don't ever want there to be that, uh, that fear that a book I'm reading is... I'm being paid to write well of it or, or anything like that. I, I just want it to be my thoughts on, on each book and, and, and for you not to, to wonder if, if, uh, if it's biased in, in, in a monetary type of way. So uh, that trust is very important to me. And, and so I, I'm just not going to, um, I'm not going to bother with that, uh, with trying to monetize it. And uh, honestly, there, there's just, there's so many other benefits to this project and, and with people I've met and that, uh, I, I just want this to be a passion project and, and to, to have a good time with it and not to worry about the, uh, the money side of things. 
So last thing I want to cover in the, the state of the, the podcast and the state of the project is uh, a website revamp. I'm, I'm a website developer by trade, so I'm, I'm working on, on some updates to the site right now. The biggest one that I, that I want you to be aware of in, in, looking, in, in going forward is I, I'll have this up in the next week or two, but I'm, I'm going to put some list suggestions, uh, reading list suggestions up on the site. And I'm going to have one that is 12 books another that's 24, and then another that's 52. So if you're looking to get started in the new year with, with your own reading project, and you just you need some, some good suggestions, uh, that's really how this project got started for me, is I, I needed help picking out books. And that's what Tools of Titans did for me, is it, is it led me to some, some books that I didn't know of, uh, books that had impacted major influencers, um, uh, people at the top of their field. I thought maybe if, if that book had an impact on that person, it, it might impact me as well. So I'm going to do something similar and, and just put together plans of here are 12 books. If, if you want to read one book per month in the new year, here's, here are some suggestions. Or if you, want to, if you want to try to do two per month, here are 24 books that I suggest. And if you want to try for one a week, here are 52 books that I suggest. And here are some plans. Uh, another thing I have on the website, if, if you're unfamiliar with the Books of Titans website, I've I uh, anytime Tim Ferriss has a podcast episode, I I add to a full list of all the books that have ever been su- suggested on on his podcast. So if if you need a uh, suggestion, that is a fantastic chart. It's searchable, so you can search by guest, you can search by book to see how many times it's been suggested. Uh, that's one of the top pages on my website. People come to that from from all over the place and so just go to books of titans.com forward set forward slash list and you'll see that full list there it's it's well over 2,000 books now and it's a great way to to find find books that you would want to read uh also have other revamps on the site so uh go ahead and and check it out when you can books of titans.com Now into segment two and some key insights from the books that I've read. So I'm going to start by just highlighting one from from this year that spanned a couple of books, and then I'll I'll cover four that uh, span the project as a whole. So these are like overarching ideas. I've read 150 books for this project so far, uh, 151, and these are the ideas that have spanned all these books that, that I keep seeing pop up. Uh, but then the ones this year, here, here here's the main one from this year. And it came from two different books, uh, Narrative of the Life of Frederick, Frederick Douglass and then the Gulag Archipelago. And so in Narrative of the Life of Frederick, Frederick Douglass, uh, Douglass says that slaveholding is as harmful to the slaveholder as to the slave. I'm going to say that again. Slaveholding is as harmful to the slaveholder as to the slave. Now, Frederick Douglass was a slave and he made that statement. Can you imagine making that statement? I mean, he had been, he had been whipped. His he had been through hell and back. Uh, his fam- he had seen things done to his family, just indescribable things. He had seen the impact of slavery on other slaves. He had escaped slavery, and then he spent the rest of his life trying to help the abolition movement to abolish slavery in the in the south of the United States. But he made that comment that slaveholding is as harmful to the slaveholder as to the slave. Because for the slaveholder, it is destroying their soul. He saw, he, he, he would get passed around to different slaveholders. And some were first-time slaveholders. And he would watch as, as they, would, they would just deteriorate as humans in the process of owning another person and, and beating that person. Uh, they might start out kind, but they just became monsters. And so that is an unbelievable statement to make uh, as someone who has suffered as a slave. Similar in the Gulag Archipelago, Solzhen Edison makes the comment, or he asks the question, who is being punished in the Gulags? By all appearances, it would seem that the prisoners are being punished and the guards are gaining position and status. So the guard, the guards are warm. They have food. They're, they're not being beaten. Um, they're moving up in position and, and salary and all that as, as they, as they become better guards. 
and the prisoners are being tortured. They're dying. Uh, so by by all uh, visual, by all sights, it, it would seem that the prisoners are the ones who are being punished in the gulag. But Solzhenitsyn flips that around and he says, what if, what if the meaning of life is the development of the soul? What if it's not about position and gaining higher status and more money, but instead, what if it is about developing your soul? And Solzhenitsyn makes the comment that when he is in prison, he, is, he, he nourished his soul. He nourished his soul in the gulags. And the guards were destroying their soul. And so very similar to what Frederick Douglass said, but he, he, he Solzhenitsyn and flips, thing, flips things around and says that, no, it's not the prisoner that is being punished. It is the guard that is being punished because the guard is losing his soul. That is just uh, amazing insight and, and just incredible to hear it from the people who suffered from those those situations, from slavery and from, from being put in a gulag. So that, that's one kind of overarching thing from 2019, from the books I read. Um, the thing I keep thinking about. So as, for the project as a whole, here are, are four ideas that I've seen come up in a number of books. The first is the importance of time. And, and this comes up in in novels, in memoirs, but just how fast time goes, how fleeting it is, and how important it is to 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 guard your time and to spend it with with the right people and to spend it with the people you love and to guard that time to not to not let it flitter away and, and waste away. Uh, the second idea, uh, that of daily habits. This one com- comes up all the time. It comes up, it's come up every single year in, in a variety of books, but just the importance of putting daily habits into place. And there are books out there that can help you get better with habits, but um, you can change things in your life drastically by daily habits. And it may seem counterintuitive because that daily habit might just be one simple thing towards a goal each day. But over time, that compounds and there's compound interest with that. And those daily habits turn into to major changes in your life. Another key idea is that of first things first. And the picture I always get is, is uh, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen somebody do this, but if you have like a, a, a jar and you've got big rocks and small rocks and the big rocks signifying big projects and the small rocks just kind of random, random different things. If you put those small rocks in the jar first and then try to get the big rocks in, they, they won't fit. But if you put the big rocks in and then the small rocks, everything will fit in. And so just this idea of focusing on the, the important things first. And a lot of times those will make some of the smaller things irrelevant. So th- another idea that comes up a lot in, the, uh, in, in these books. And the final one is that uh, happiness cannot be pursued. It's a byproduct of other things. And, you know, we grow up, especially in the States, we, uh, the United States, we hear uh, the pursuit of happiness and, and everybody wants us to be happy and, and parents have their co- kids go to college. They want them to be happy and they put them in things because they want them to be happy. And I, I just hope so-and-so is happy. I mean, you just hear that all the time, but you can't pursue happiness. You, you can pursue other things that might lead to happiness and that could be a byproduct of that, but happiness itself cannot be pursued. And that's just a, another idea that comes up in, in a lot of the books and just something interesting to, uh, to think about. So on to segment three and listener questions. So here are some questions that I've gotten from social media. I asked a question on Instagram, uh, if anyone had questions that, uh, that, that they would like me to cover on the episode. And then I'm going to highlight some other ones that have, that have come up quite a bit, um, throughout, throughout the, uh, the years of this project. So I'm going to start with one from Lou Lyon. Um, do you donate the book somewhere after you read them? And my answer to that is no. I thought about it after the 2017 reading list, but I keep them all. And, and part of that is 
looking at the books helped me to remember them. And so I'll do that. And then I, I write so much in my books now that um, uh, I can pick a book off my shelf, look at the back cover and see my main notes from that book. So I know other people do like a note card system uh, for the books they read, and then they can go back to that note card system. But for me, a lot of my notes for the books are, are in the book itself. So that becomes uh, a key piece of helping to remember the book and just even visually looking at the book. I, I know one thing Tim Ferriss will do is is he'll he'll face a book out so you can see the cover of it, and he'll put those around his house for, for the books that he wants to remember the lessons. And so I, I do not donate the books. Uh, if, if I want to give the book to somebody, I just buy that, buy it for them. Um, I, I want them to have a fresh copy as well. I don't want them to, to have one that has all my notes in it. Uh, he has a, a second question. What store do you buy most of your books from? I get them from three different places. One is uh, landmark booksellers here in Franklin, Tennessee. So that's a local local booksellers uh, seller. I, li- I like going in to the bookstore and seeing and, and looking at the books and, and that sort of thing. So that's the first place and, and the main place. The second is Amazon. Um, and then the third is thrift books. So thrift books has a lot of books in the three to $4 range. And then you can, they're, they're, they're different prices based on the, the quality of the book and, and they're used, used books. But that's a great way to get a lot of the books on your reading list, especially older books. Uh, you can get them for between three and four dollars, and and uh, after you order a certain amount, it's free shipping, and so y- you can do this project and not spend a lot of money. And so those are the three places that I get most of my books. Emil Lopez asks, "How do you manage your time for the reading sessions, and how do you concentrate and avoid distractions?" So for managing my time, I I do most of my reading early in the morning and and late at night. And I, I do that because that's when my family is, is sleeping. And so I, I, I'm, I work during the day. I, I work for myself, so I don't, I don't have a whole lot of, of, of extra time, especially with the kids. And so uh, I, I, I do it. I, I wake up early. I get some coffee going. I, I read then before I, I go running. And then I'll read in the, in the evenings. And I can usually get in uh, about 50 pages if, if, I, if I do that. That's uh, 50 pages per, per day. And then for concentrating and avoiding distractions, um, I have a chair in my office. That's my reading chair. I, I do probably 95% of my reading there. And I, I don't have a TV in my office. I don't have, uh, I, I mean, my, my phone's next to me because I'm tracking my, my reading, but I'm, I'm, uh, I try to silence that so I'm not getting bombarded with text messages. And then the other thing of just reading early in the morning and late at night, there's not as many people texting or, or emailing or, or anything. So I just I keep the computer off when I'm reading and, and just try to avoid distractions that way. And then I'm usually in a room uh, by, my, by myself. Um, <clears throat> another thing for managing time with the reading sessions, I, I track my time and I use the Bookly app. And you can just search for that uh, Bookly app uh, on the iPhone or, or um, uh, I believe they're on Android as well. And so I, I, I just like keeping track of and seeing how long it takes me to read a book, uh, how many minutes per page, that kind of thing. And, and then I share that on each podcast episode as well. Kale Letkeman from uh, Canada, he, he writes uh, uh, a couple questions. The first one, do you rank the books at the end of the year or along the way? And yes, I do. And I, I release that at the end of each year. I'll be releasing the 2019 rankings here in the next week or so. That, that'll be part of the, the website revamp. But if you go to booksatitans.com and look at my 2017 and 2018 list, you'll see a, a link or a button at the top of those lists that uh, show my my rankings for the year. So that could be another way for you to, to find some books and see which ones I enjoyed the most. Uh, his other question is, uh, you select all your books before the year starts. Surely new books pop out throughout the year that you really want to read. Do you just put them on the list for next year? What's the benefit of reading this way? Uh, this is a good, good, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad he asked this question because, um, it's something I, I, I worry about in the sense of uh, what if a really good book pops up that I wasn't aware of. Um, and so a, f- a few things I do. One, I I like having the my reading list set out a year in advance. And I, I didn't think I would like it as much as I, I do. But one 
major benefit is I, it helps me avoid books that get a lot of hype. So when a new book comes out and I really want to read it, a lot of times it's just, I'm, I'm kind of joining into the, the overall hype for the book and maybe it's marketed really well, or maybe the author is, is super wealthy and they've just put a ton of money into advertising this. And so I'm seeing the book on advertisements. I'm seeing it in bookstores. I'm hearing it on a lot of the podcasts I listen to, but that could be just a result of somebody with a lot of money marketing the heck out of the book. And it might not be a really good book. So I've, I've actually come across some books like that and it, it's better for me to wait and, and give that book some time. It, it's the, the Lindy effect from, um, from Talib and just the, the longer a book has been out, the more it has been tested. And so Talib talks about that. He, he doesn't really care of, of how his books do right now. He cares about how his books are doing 30 years from now. And he'll know if he has written a good book with in 30 years, uh, it's still selling and it's still doing well. And so for the books that pop up through the year, uh, in 2019, I, I did take a, uh, two books off of my original list and put in other books. Um, and, and those ended up being really, really good and, and timely books. But I try to actually avoid that because I don't want to get burned with a book that, that shouldn't be on there because of, because of the hype. So yeah, to, to answer the question further, I, I usually, if it, it's a book I really want to read that, that comes out during the year, I will just move it on to the, to the next year. Um, G- Gio Malav writes, are, are the concepts in the books timeless? or relevant to our modern day and age of technology, innovation, and change? And yes, and, and I, th- I think he may have been asking that question in particular to some of the fiction. And I, I want to address this. It comes up in one of the other questions here as well. But especially with this project in, in Books of Titans and it coming from Tools of Titans and in, in, uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast being in, in books being a lot about productivity and that sort of thing, a, a, a lot of people I come in contact with through this project are all about nonfiction books. They're all about productivity books, self-help books, that sort of thing. And, and that, that's fine. And there's some gems in those books, but the real gems come in fiction because fiction allows you to go inside a character and go deep and see their motivations and see why they're doing what they're doing. And you'll actually be confronted with yourself more in fiction than you, than you will in nonfiction, because you'll see a character doing something you do and you'll, you'll think, Oh my God, I, I didn't realize that's, that's what that looked like, uh, to other people or to uh, internally or how that can, how that can manifest itself over time. Um, so I would I would encourage you to read fiction more than nonfiction, and so I think that's where this particular question question is coming from. Like in the age of technology, does does fiction hold sway? And I would say yes, and more so because fiction will help you see things that no book on technology will ever allow you to see. Uh, he asked a second question, do you have a criteria or checklist you use to select a particular book? And yes, I, I have many, I've covered that in, in another podcast episode of, of how to choose a, a reading list. And so I'll, I'll have particular buckets for each year. So I, I know each year I want to read a Shakespeare play. So that one, one book on, on my list for 2020 is going to be Hamlet. That's, uh, and, and each year going forward. Um, I, I for the time being, I'm going to do an Agatha Christie book each year. So uh, each year, I'll have a book by by her. Uh, George MacDonald, that's my wife's favorite author, so I always want to be reading George MacDonald. C.S. Lewis is my favorite author, so each year, I'll have a C.S. Lewis book. I am very ignorant on the Middle East, so each year, I like to have one or two books on the Middle East. Uh, I'm I, my family heritage is Norwegian. I try to have one book about Norway each year. So that's the kind of thing. I, I have certain buckets, and that ends up covering a lot of the books on my list each year, of just the buckets that I always want to be reading about. So uh, so yes, I do have um, that sort of, of, of criteria of, of selecting a book. But just more in general, um, I, I, I choose books that I see in a lot of places. So I may get a recommendation from a friend for a particular book. Um, there are some people where if they recommend a book, uh, it will be on my list because they are 
on their recommendations. Uh, Jason, my my co- po- podcast co-host, he's one of those. If he if he recommends a book, it it will go on my list. I, I it's I won't think about it. I'll just put it on there. Um, other people they <laughs> they might not have made good suggestions in the past, and so I, I I won't just necessarily automatically take their their suggestions. But um, but yeah, that, that's some of the criteria for for the books. The First Domino Project asks this question. One book that you would recommend rereading every quarter? I thought about this one. That There's not a book that I would recommend rereading every quarter. I, I can't think of one that would be that impactful that it would be every quarter because I, I want to always be reading new books. And I'm, I'm reading, or, or books I haven't read before. And in 2020, I'm reading a lot of books that I've read maybe like 20 years ago just to, to read their books that have had a huge impact on my life and I want to reread them. Um, but one to re reread every quarter, I, I would say maybe uh, I would expand that out to, to maybe every year. Uh, I try to read the Bible every year that that's more of like, uh, throughout the year. So just as part of my morning, morning reading, uh, if you read four or five chapters a day in the Bible, you'll get through it in a year. In 2020, that's my first book, so I'm actually just going to read through the whole thing. It's not I'm not going to do it over the full year, but I'm going to just start to finish read the Bible. That's book one on my list next year. So, if anything, it it, it would be the Bible, and it would be yearly. But I there's not a book I would read every quarter. If you push me and I had to choose one, it it would probably be Man's Search for Meaning. If I had to read one book every quarter. Uh, Chandler Lamar Densley asks, what advice do you have for someone who is trying it out for the first time in 2020? Also, how do you choose your balance of fiction and nonfiction? So, uh, advice for someone who's trying it out for the first time in 2020, he's, he's talking about, uh, setting up a reading list for the, he's, he's going to do that for the first time. So, uh, for advice for, for someone doing that is to view it as a daily habit and to, to look at it as a per page um, not, don't look at it like if, if you're going to be reading 20 books, don't, don't read Well, I need to read so, so, so many books per, per, uh, month, or if it's 52 books, I need to read one a week, but find out how many pages are in those books and then divide it by 365 days. Um, and, and then you'll find out how many pages you need to be reading on a daily basis. And don't beat yourself up if you don't read that many in one day, because some days you'll read more than, than you need, and other days you'll, you'll read less. But the, the, the idea is to, to have a, a balance in that and, and try, to, try to get to that daily habit of, of a particular page count. Um, and then for the fiction versus nonfiction question, I, I don't have like a, a set balance that it has to be 50% fiction, 50% nonfiction, but I, I do try to include a lot of fiction in there. And, and for the reasons I mentioned earlier of, of fiction, really giving deep insight into, into people and, and, and to, to yourself. Tremonte Relford asks this question as you're reading a book, uh, as you're reading of a book progresses and you become disinterested in the content or style of writing, how do you commit to finishing it anyway? Uh, that's one of the, one of my ideas or, or I guess, um, rules for my reading project is that I finish every book. And I, I know there's a lot of debate about that. Um, I know a lot of people say that you should just discard a book if, if you're not enjoying it. And I would say that is probably true in, in most of the, of the cases. But I spend so much time thinking about the books that I want to read and compiling my list that by the time it gets to the 52 books that I'm reading in a given year, I've put so much thought into each of the books that they are books that I, I really want to read. So first off, just in, in creating a reading plan like this and not just like, I, I call it the serendipity approach that I would do in the past, I'd like go to a bookstore and, oh, that's a cool cover or, oh, that looks good. Or I've read something else by that author. I'm going to read this. Um, I, I would come into more trouble in, with that approach because I, w- I would I would be reading more books that I, I would get into it and be like, oh, I don't want to read this. But just by having a, a plan that gets rid of, of, of a lot of that um, that problem. But now if I do become disinterested, disinter- I just have to go through it because that's one of my rules. I, I have to finish every book. And you know what? 
some of the gems are towards the end of a book that I don't, I didn't really want to finish. And so that's also helped in, in just fighting through it. And, and it goes back to that idea again of a daily habit of, well, I, I you know, I, I need to get through 50 pages today and whether I hate this book or absolutely love it and, and, and will stop or, or not go to sleep early tonight or, or on time because I want to keep reading. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's how I, how I, how I think that Molly asks, how much do you let reviews and general consensus determine whether or not you'll read a book? If you choose a book only to find it's been poorly received, do you move on or read it anyways? I'm glad, uh, Molly asked this question because I, I actually had a book on my list for 2020 upheaval by Jared diamond. And I took it off based on one review. And I, 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 I kind of wish I hadn't have done that. Um, and the review was just nasty. I, I think it was in the New York Times and, and it was just nasty and, and said that uh, it, it wasn't well written and not well um, uh, researched and, and that sort of thing. And, and I dropped the book because of, of that. And, and I, I wish I hadn't. So in, in your question of how much do you let reviews and general consensus determine whether you'll or not you'll read a book, unfortunately, uh, and apparently it, it has a big impact. And I don't like that. And, and um, I, I try not to let it, but it's obviously going to. Where, where I try to rein that in is to go to trusted sources for my book recommendations. So in, in the case of the upheaval heaval book, where it was just some uh, New York Times uh, reviewer that I'd never heard of, I, sh- I should not let that determine what I read or not read. But I should let determine people who I respect their suggestions. So my podcast co-host, Jason, I, I would, like I mentioned before, he, I, I want I want to take his his suggestions seriously. There are other people I would take their suggestions seriously. And then it becomes more of a, well, am I, am I seeing this book in multiple places? So if if somebody I, I respect greatly has suggested this book, okay, that that's on my radar now. Um, and I, I keep a, a yearly list of, of all the different books that I hear of that that might be good ones for for next year's list. But then if I see it in a bookstore and I look at it and, ooh, this looks really good. And then maybe I, I, I see a review of it uh, and then something else or, or it pops up on... on uh, uh, email that I get from different bookseller newsletters. That that's uh, that's where that that book will likely make it to my list. Then, so yes, unfortunately, reviews and general consensus do determine some of the books. Um, but I I want to try to avoid that. But I also want to let some of those books come in. I, I each year I do want to read some of the the bestsellers just to see what's why is this currently a bestseller? Why is this trending? Um, so thank you for that question, Molly. Uh, another one by, uh, Jesse lands here. And he asked, do you ever struggle with a book, set it aside to move on and come back to it? What's the best way you've found to regain your pace if you fall behind? So for the qu- first question, I, I, I addressed that. Um, but, uh, I, I, I guess further, uh, to that question, I do not, um, s- stop a book go into another one and then come back to it. Uh, so another rule is just, I, I, I read them in order. And so I set the, the order of my reading list, I randomize it. And then I, that's the order I do for that year. So I have to finish the book before I go to the next one. So I'm not going to set it aside and move on. I'm on, I'm only reading one book at a time that that's, uh, that's part of my rules for this, this project. And then for the best way you found to regain your pace, if you fall behind, um, just again, viewing it as a, as a, a daily habit and, and reading and just, just continuing on and not beating yourself up. Um, the, the year I made it through 48 books out of 52, yes, I wanted to make it through 52, but, um, I made it through 48 and, and that's fine. And, 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 uh, you know, you can't beat yourself up for, for, for getting behind. Um, but, but just continue on and, and keep going from, from where you are. Uh, here's a few other questions, and, and these are more ones that that uh, I get over and over. So this one comes from Joel Thor. Uh, do you take notes in the books as you read? Yes, I do. I I, uh, I have a pen. Um, I use Muji pens. I love Muji pens, and I underline as I'm reading. So I uh, I I highlight as I'm reading. I will write notes in the margin 
as I'm reading. Um, I put a star next to content that I want to remember. Um, I put a big star if it's something that is like key insight, amazing something. And then I put like multiple stars if it's something that just has like shattered my world. So uh, that's what I do as I'm reading. At the end of each chapter, I will usually write a few kind of over overarching themes for that chapter. And then in the back of the book, that's where I put page numbers and ideas for things that I want to remember. I will write quotes there. Um, and that's where I go when I, when I prepare a podcast or I write out uh, a review or share my thoughts on the website, that that's where I go is to the back of, of the book. So yes, I, I, I take notes in the books as I read them. And because of that, I read sp- I only read physical books. I don't read on the iPad anymore. I know you can take notes there, but um, uh, the the act of writing in the books actually helps me, re- me remember as well. Uh, Megan Tucker asks, what are the top five books you would recommend to someone in their 20s? Perhaps maybe books you wish you would have read in your 20s. And uh, these are the five that I would suggest. Man's Search for Meaning, The Gulag Archipelago, Start With Why, Thinking Fast and Slow in Guns, Germs, and Steel. So Man's Search for Meaning, just uh, out of the 151 books I've read, that is my my favorite. It's an unbelievable book. Uh, the Gulag Archipelago, again, just amazing insight into the human soul. Uh, start with why. If you're in your 20s, that's a, a good one to get you thinking on why you're doing what you do, what you, what you do. and I, I, I really enjoyed that book, and I think it has a lot of application just in a personal life, but also in, in a business and really understanding why it is what you want to do. And, and if, if you do put, get, get a statement together of, of your why, uh, I, I love it because it can span a variety of things in your life. Um, it, it could cover different types of jobs. It could cover work that you do. Uh, nonprofit work. It could cover uh, sports you're involved in, thing, activities you do, but it's your why. It all go, it goes back to the singular why. Uh, and, and I really like that idea, especially if you're you're getting started in your, your life. Thinking fast and slow is, is just, it helps you understand the types of thinking, your uh, kind of initial emotional uh, quick thinking, and then your more reasoned thinking and what uh, automatically is triggered in certain situations and just how you can think better. Uh, so that, that's a really important one. And that that's one that I see pop up in so many different books. It's, it's a foundational book in the sense that you will see that referenced in so many other books. And then the last one, Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's just a good book to to read to get a framework for history. It's not the end-all be-all in the, the best book on history ever, but it does provide a framework of thinking of different societies and, and um, what were they focused on and where were they located and how did that impact trade and agriculture. And I, it, it gives an excellent framework for looking at history going forward. Jennifer uh, Ailing asks, so what are you currently reading now that you've finished the 2019 list? And so I finished December 10th with my 52 books. And so I had three weeks here at the end of December where I could just do whatever. And um, that was fantastic. So the first week I, I didn't read anything. And uh, I watched a few movies. And that was fun. And just I, I, I actually was super busy with work in December. So I actually worked a lot too. So the time I would usually been been reading, I, I was trying trying to uh, catch up on work, and and then uh, after that week, I read a dissertation from my college roommate. So he just earned his PhD, and he wrote a PhD, uh, his dissertation for that and, and defended it. And he sent me his dissertation, and I read that with uh, with a lot of joy. That was that was really fun, and I'm going to be talking to him about it. Um, uh, in a few days. So I'm looking forward to that. It would, he just did an excellent job and really proud of him. And, and, uh, so it was neat to read that. And then now I'm reading a book called adorning the dark by Andrew Peterson. This is a book that, uh, I requested from the, from the publisher. Um, I have a, f- a few other books that, um, were sent to me this past year. I may try to read them in the, the final few days here 
of 2019. My, my other idea is that uh, I, I want to read a book about raising daughters. So I have two daughters and um, I have a few books here on my bookshelves that I have not read and I just need help in that area. So I need, I probably pick those up. And the last question here, how many hours do you put aside each day for reading? I, I I want to stress this, that I, I, I don't view it as time. I view it as, as pages. So I, I try to get in 50 pages per day. Now that's obviously different per book. Sometimes 50 pages, I can get through that in, in an hour. Sometimes it may take three or four hours to get through 50 pages. So it, it's different. It's, it's obviously dependent on work and, and family and activities and all those sorts of things. But, um, I, I always carry a book with me, so when when I'm out and about, uh, it's, it's amazing how much reading you can get done during those those odd hours, uh, especially if I can be disciplined and not be checking my my phone. I can I can get in a lot of hours uh, of reading that time. So, in if if I was back in college, I, I did read a lot in college uh, for fun, not just uh, schoolwork. Um, so if you're in college, you have more time right now than you'll ever have in the rest of your life. And it may not seem like that. Um, and I know you are forced to read a lot of things that you might not be wanting to read for just for school, but you do have a lot of time. So I put those hours to use and and start, start reading now. Um, and then if you're later on life, you have a lot of, a lot of, um, responsibilities, just find the time and and you may have to get rid of some things in your life that, that are not, that are not fulfilling. They're not. Uh, they're not going to give you a sense of accomplishment. Um, those that could be watching hours of news, watching hours of, of sports, or, or just just TV and, and movies in general. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode. I'm not sure what I'll be recording next. Uh, my first book for next year is the Bible. I'm anticipating that taking between forty and, and sixty days to read. So that's going to be a a good chunk of the first part of the year. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be recording podcasts every other week going forward. Uh, so I, I, at this point, I'm not sure if I'm going to wait until I finish the Bible to, to cover it on the podcast or if I'm just going to cover different chunks of the Bible. But um, but I'll be back in a, in a couple weeks um, with with something. So thanks for listening. I'm, I'm having a blast with this project. I, I love it. I, I always want to be reading uh, for the for the rest of my life, and, and this project has really helped me um, read more books and and then remember what it is I'm reading. So I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at Eric at booksoftitans.com. That's Eric with a K, so E R I K at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought of this episode or other ones. Um, I'd love to hear about your reading project. Uh, maybe you're starting one. Um, maybe maybe a, a, I love hearing about books that have sparked. Um, reading projects or, or sparked a desire to read more. I love hearing about those. I, I call those the hinge book, the, the book that all the other books in your library hinge upon. Uh, so send me, send me that by email. I'd love to, to hear uh, any questions you have, that, that kind of thing. Um, you can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter at Books of Titans. And then remember, the, the website's stock full of resources to help you find books and create a reading list. That's booksoftitans.com. I'll be back in, in a couple weeks in the new year, in the new decade, in 2020. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.